tell you a story. Um, so John and I have a little Yorkie. Her name's Nyla. And she, when I say little, I mean little. She is about three pounds soaking wet. Um, in fact, last night she was curled up on the couch and I turned over to John and said, how did this wild squirrel get into our house? <laughs> Very tiny. Um, and and I, it surprises me at how so much energy and attitude can fit into this tiny little creature. Um, the, the other day, I, I came home for lunch to let her outside, and I walked through the door, and she was elated. She likes to stand up when she's really excited. She'll stand up on her hind legs with her arms like this, like a little gopher, and just jump up and down, up and down, and, and be whimpering and whining, can't contain her excitement. And you say, hi, Nyla, and she, oh, gets so excited, and she runs, laps runs laps through the dining room, through the living room, comes back, oh, are you following me? Runs again, runs again. And I thought, I thought, you know, I wonder if this is a little glimpse, a little glimpse of the joy and celebration of God when we return home. I thought about the pain that she has our little Yorkie has when we're away, when she thinks we're gone and she misses us. But then we come home and she celebrates and she's excited and she's so energetic. <laughs> Stories are pretty powerful. They invite us into a world to create and dream and imagine did any of you think of your own little dog when I was telling that story? Maybe a big dog. Or maybe you imagined, in your, you started to have visions of little dogs dancing, happy to see their little human come home, maybe a GIF or a video you've seen on the internet. Stories can entertain, they can teach, they can comfort. And when we hear the word storyteller or story time, our initial instinct is probably to think about children. Children going to story time, sitting at the storyteller's feet in awe of a world they've been invited to, to dream and imagine and create together. And maybe that's the childlike faith and curiosity that us grown-ups sometimes think we've grown out of. The Bible is filled with stories. I don't need to tell you that. Stories of narratives, especially in the, in the Hebrew text, in the Old Testament. In fact, um, those are the roots of our faith. Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Laurel K. puts it that our whole story begins with stories talking about the Old Testament, the Hebrew text. And stories passed down from generation to generations, stories meant for a purpose, written for a particular people in a particular time, but stories that still speak to us today and teach us today. In the Wesleyan tradition here in the United Methodist Church, we interpret scripture um, by looking at the history what um, that I know about history and about the context of this scripture, how does that inform how I read this text? We look at scripture based on reason, using the reasoning of my mind. How can I reason while I'm interpreting this text? The mind that God gave me to reason. We use tradition. What has the church traditionally thought of this scripture? How can I use that to interpret this text? And we use experience. God is still speaking today, and God speaks to each one of us in different ways. How can I use what God has spoken to me through my experiences to interpret this text? Jesus told a lot of stories, parables as they're called, stories that took everyday common experiences that would be easily recognizable by the crowds. And he spoke in everyday language. 
that connected to his audience. He took what was familiar, and he used those stories to reveal truth about God. He spoke in the storytelling format that was familiar to his culture and different than the religious leaders, the way that they spoke. Because he spoke in a way that everybody could hear and understand. So that made his messages personal, personal, relatable, and spiritual. Let's take a look at one of his stories here. We're starting in Luke chapter 15 at verse 11. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of my property that will belong to me. So his father divided the property between them. And a few days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and traveled to a distant country. There he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a famine, severe famine, took place throughout the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating. No one gave him anything. <clears throat> But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger? I'll get up, I'll go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. Now there's another story where a young one finds himself far from home and among swine. <laughs> a common story of our day, Simba, the Lion King. For those who it might be an unfamiliar story, the Lion King is a story of a young cub next in line to be king after his father, Mufasa. Simba is curious and sometimes rebellious. He teeters the line, but he is so ready to be king and be in charge. However, Simba's uncle Scar is also ready to be king and be in charge. He wants the throne for himself, and he's driven so much by this greed that he murders Mufasa, Simba's father. And then Scar tells Simba a story convinces Simba that it is Simba's fault that Mufasa is dead. He convinces Simba that his very own mother will reject him if she finds out. And Scar tells him he should run away and never return. And Simba believed this story. This became his story. He started to believe he was unlovable that he could never go home, that he was an outcast, a nobody, and the only way he was going to make it through life was a kuna matata. But not in the peaceful, liberating way of a kuna matata, no worries. Rather, in a way that gave in to isolation, disconnection. He wasn't going to care about anyone or anything. This is who he is now. He thought, this is my story. Simba had come to believe that the worst things about him were the only things about him. Much like the prodigal son. With, with little effort, the parallels between these two stories and characters line up. Simba, much like the prodigal son, has run away from home and has told himself a story. Just like the prodigal son who says, I'm not worthy to even eat the slop of pigs. The prodigal son is guilt-ridden for leaving home, for what that has cost him and what that says about him. He thinks his story is one of an outcast. And one for, for a Jewish man to be working with pigs, to be eating after pigs that were considered unclean creatures by his culture, his religion, well, that's as low as a person could get. 
And these stories that the prodigal son and Simba have come to believe about themselves, not about their actions, not about what they have done, but about who they are. That somehow their actions have stripped away their identity, stripped away any value or worth that they have. They're empty, unworthy, and that's where Simba finds himself in this clip. Let's take a look. Look down there. That's not my father. It's just my reflection. No! Look hard. You see? He lives in you. I go back. I'm not who I used to be. Remember who you are. You are my son and the one true king. Father runs to him, 
He doesn't even have to make it all the way home. Just headed in the right direction and God is going to run out and meet you there. The prodigal son thinks he knows his story. He thinks, I will be rejected by my father. I'm no longer worthy to be called his son. I'll eat pig slop if you'll only let me. And if my father accepts me back, it will only be as the lowest of the low, not as his son. But his dad, his father says, no, no, that's not the story. You're not rejected. You're my child. And you are home. You were lost and now you are found. You are loved. I know who you really are. More than what you've become, more than what others have said about you, I know who you are. I'm betting there's something in these stories this morning that's relatable. As prodigal sons, prodigal daughters, prodigal children, maybe we can relate to the fear of being rejected or to letting stories that others have said of our worth lay claim on our lives. Or thinking that who we are is not good enough, acceptable, or worthy of God's love. But what happens at the end of the prodigal son, what happens at the end of that clip from the Lion King, Christ is with us. There is no place we can run to that is away from him. And when we speak of ourselves, when we speak of others, we have to remember the stories we're creating that can do great good and great harm. We are all children of God, made in the image of the divine, each and every one of us, a child of God, called for a purpose. The prodigal son and Simba have wrestled with their identities, with who they are, thinking that part of their story is their whole story. But part of any of our stories is not the whole story. Whether it's stories we've told ourselves or stories others have told about our own worth, God refuses to let us forget who we are. God insists on reminding us again and again, drawing us back to God's community, drawing us back to relationship with God. Brene Brown, a researcher and storyteller of courage, vulnerability, shame, she has these beautiful words that capture this very well. She says, you can't outrun hardship. But the good news is, you can't outrun grace either. So while we're far off, still on the horizon, God is going to break out into a sprint, beelining for us to meet us there and to welcome us home. Thanks be to God.